everyone. I'm JP, the youth pastor here at Bear Creek Assembly of God. And I'm Jenny, the kids and online pastor. And we want to welcome you to Bear Creek and tell you how excited we are that you chose us to worship with today. We're working on updating our technology here, and we would love for you to connect with us if you are new to Bear Creek or update your information if you have been with us for quite a while. If you are a first time guest with us today, we would love to learn more about you. You can text NEW to 1-844-259-0900 or open your camera app and scan this code on the screen now. If you're a regular attender, we need you to update your information with us as well. You can text UPDATE to 1-844-259-0900 or open your camera app and scan this update code. By updating or adding your information through this text link, you will be enable us to connect with you quickly and easily. More advancements will be coming soon. Stay tuned in the coming weeks. Our BCAG Young Adults Group will be meeting next Sunday, July 11th, immediately following service for lunch at Barbarito's. You can contact Alex or Mallory Tees for more information. Ladies of all ages are invited to a ladies brunch Saturday, July 17th, right here in the Fellowship Hall at 9.30 a.m. You can contact Lee Fuller for more information. We have some new exciting things happening next Sunday right here in at Bear Creek. So stay tuned and make sure you're here in the service next Sunday. Stay connected with your church family online through our Facebook campus. If you're on the go, listen to sermons, Bible studies, and more on our podcast channel. Stay tuned for more advancements coming soon to enhance your online experience throughout the entire week. Thank you so much for all our guests and church family for being here with us today. If you didn't, if you didn't know, today we're doing communion. And so I hope everybody received a communion element. If you didn't, our ushers are, I shouldn't call them ushers. They are a hospitality team is prepared to serve you if you need them. If you're watching online with us this morning, if you want to get something out of the kitchen and take communion with us, obviously we encourage you to do so. But we're about to worship the Lord for how long that he desires our worship. And at the end of that, as we transition, we will we will remember what he's done for us today. So let this be a time of worship. As you give adoration to the Lord, but also let it be a time of reflection on your own life. The Bible tells us that we should work out our salvation daily with fear and trembling. And then later on, we find in the scriptures that Paul urges us to examine ourselves before we do this. So it's a time of that. But I don't want you to make it about you. Do you hear your pastor this morning? Evaluate yourself. Examine yourself. Don't condemn. Don't let condemnation come in because God's not one of... It's, maybe there's conviction. And then give it to the Lord and focus on Him. Focus on Him. Amen. Let's worship together.
Isn't it awesome to be a child of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords? That song talks about a room being prepared. We know Jesus says, I go away to prepare a place. But do you know that today, not in the afterlife, but today there's a place in your father's house, in your father's family. Isn't it awesome to be a part of something that's bigger than you? That's greater than you. And I'm going to use the word that's beyond your own personal kingdom. There's something greater. And I don't know about you, but I'm thankful. No one's life is by chance. Hear me this morning. If you're here, understand your life is not here. You're not here just by chance. God chose to give you life. And he prepared a place for you. Father, I thank you so much. God, for the fact that you have a plan for all of our lives, Lord, that you love us. Your word tells us in Jeremiah, you love us so much, God, that you've got plans for us. And Lord, you don't want to hurt us, but give us a hope, a future, God. Lord, you love your kids. And I'm so thankful because I feel that love today. Thank you, God. Now, Lord, as we prepare to remember you, you and your death and resurrection, God, right now, Father, help us, Lord, to bring every thought into captivity, Lord, as we celebrate the death of your son, Jesus, our Lord and Savior. Mark 14, 22 says, and as they were eating, he took bread and after blessing it, he broke it and gave it to them and said, take, this is my body. And he took a cup and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and they all drank of it. And he said to them, this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many. Truly, I say to you, I will not drink again of the fruit of the vine until the day when I drink anew in the kingdom of God. Jesus gave his all. Gave his all and died on the cross for all of us so that we could realize the fact that there is more to this life than what we see in this present. We're going to preach. I'm going to, you're going to hear a little bit more about that in just a moment. But aren't you thankful that he paid the ultimate sacrifice? Don't go past this moment. Aren't you thankful that he paid the ultimate sacrifice for your salvation, for your present and your future and for eternity. Father, I thank you for the broken body of Jesus. It was broken for many. Father, as I think about the big picture of how Jesus came to die for everyone, but coming to die for everyone, he knew not everyone would receive his sacrifice. But yet he did it anyway. I believe, Father, 2,000 years ago when he hung on that cross, somehow, some way, he was looking into this moment at this time. He was looking at our lives today in the 21st century, knowing that we would need a Savior. I thank you so much for his broken body, the bruising, the beating, the piercing of his body, Lord. And I thank you for the shedding of his blood that covers a multitude. As a matter of fact, Lord, it covers all sin for eternity thank you that we can be in covenant with you through the sacrifice of your son. Let's break the bread and eat and drink of the cup. Thank you. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Praise the Lord. Thank you, worship team. You guys rocked it out today. Thank you, guys so so much amen praise the lord if you would turn in your bibles to mark chapter one and just so that you know don't be in a rush this morning it's raining outside so why hurry up to go fight the rain so and i think the lord just told me it's going to rain for at least an hour and a half so we've got time in here this morning yeah at least some of y'all are praising god thank you Woo, you just lifted this preacher spirits a little bit amen it's so good to have Sis Callahan in our presence this morning. Sis, God bless you. So good to see. She hasn't been here since the COVID broke out, and uh, just so thankful that you're able to be with us. She's been following us a little bit here and there. I've been to see her a couple times, but it's so good to see you. And it's good to have Sister Bonnie Seegers in our presence this morning. Thank you, Sister Bonnie, for coming. Uh, I know you came to be with your son, but look, you get the benefits of hearing me preach. So God... <laughs> bless you this morning. Amen. No, seriously, it's so good. And so many other faces here this morning. So good to see you all here this morning. Uh, you in Mark chapter 1? Are you in Mark chapter 1? 
There we go. There we go. Praise God. Well, I heard this about this little boy one time and his mom, they were going to church one day. They decided we're going to get up and go to church this morning. And, and as they was entering, this is the little boy's first time really being in the adult service. And his mom said, listen, sweetheart, remember what I told you now, okay? We've got to be quiet, all right? You understand why we have to be quiet, right? And the little boy said, of course, mom. It's because the people are sleeping. <laughs> I hope today you're not asleep. I hope today you're open to what the Lord has laid on my heart uh, for this fellowship. I was talking with, with Brother Andy before service, and uh, he asked me, are you ready? And I don't know if I'm ever ready. Until you've sat behind this sacred desk and spoke on behalf of God, I, I don't know how you can be ready. I'm just being honest with you, church. If for some reason it looks like it's easy, it's not. It's not. Not because of, it's not because of lack of time or prayer preparation. It's just the fact of the, what I am doing. It's so heavy, and it's, I take it so seriously. So I hope today you have come prepared. I don't want to put a downer. It's a great, man, there's anointing in here today. A bunch of our youth and leaders came before. They surprised me this morning. They didn't surprise me. I was surprised that they came to church early. We've been praying in here for 30, 40 minutes. And just, just a great presence of the Lord. And, and, uh, and I hope you're, you sense that for our guests. Don't be scared of that. God's not to be feared. As I say that, thunder. Okay, maybe he is to be feared. <laughs> feared as in awe. But don't be, don't, you have nothing. You're in a, like I told the young lady a few minutes ago, you're in a safe place this morning. Amen. Well, as we continue this journey of this is the way, it's an idea of what is discipleship. We hear it. That's a, that's a biblical term we hear a lot of. And, and if, unless you was raised to the church, that word may seem Greek, to, for lack of a better term, may seem foreign to you. Discipleship, we understand the word of discipline, discipline your body. But what is discipleship? And to be truthful with you, I think, I think I'm not going to show the stats today, but those stats I've been showing, when, when 4% of those under the age of 20 don't look at life through a biblical worldview, we're in trouble, and the generation before that is only 19%, there's a disconnect. And I think that's what God is wanting us to, to understand. Can I be honest? I can't control what other churches in our area do. I, I can't control what our denomination does as a whole our fellowship as we are I, all, all I can do is speak into those of you that come week in and week out and try to invest in you and the idea of this is not so that our attendance goes up although I hope that would be a positive benefit it's not so that we have more workers in the classrooms although I hope that is part of it the hope the hope is not to really it, the hope for me as a pastor it benefits me in a way but it really not so that it benefits me I, I want to just speak to your hearts today if you are a follower of Christ I want you to have a life that is that of a disciple of Jesus. That of a, I like to use the term follower of Jesus in the sense that I, you never stop following. You, you heard what I said earlier, the conviction that I have felt this week that God never leaves me, but a lot of times I'm, not that I'm having to drag him, but sometimes he may have to, we say nothing's impossible for God, but between me and Pastor JP, it may be hard for him sometimes to keep up with us, especially JP. But in other words, I'm doing life and I'm including God. And God says, don't do life and include me. Come with me. Follow me. Don't ask me to come along with your journey. I'm asking you. And actually, he commands us as disciples, come along with me because I have a journey for you. And it's a different way of living. And, we, and we're looking at the life of Christ in the first week. Just to let you know, if you weren't here, you missed a great service, a great sermon on water baptism, the fact that he was baptized into a new life. And that's what it is for us when we're water baptized. It's entering, it's initiation into a new life. Not that Jesus had to be saved, but he was entering to a new life in the sense of following his Father's will for his life. And last week we looked at what discipleship really is. It's about falling under the teacher. Following under the teaching. He is the, he's the rabbi. He's the teacher. We are his disciples as we follow him. He's encouraging us. What's he, what's he encouraging us to do? To follow him in a closer fellowship every day. 
Not on a, it's not a Sunday. We have to get the idea of traditional or culture ideas, norms of what being a follower of Christ is. It's not a Sunday morning thing. We come to Sunday morning because we feel conviction that this is what the Lord would have us to do, to come together with people of like precious faith, to worship Him, and then to be fed by the shepherd. The model is, I am, follow me, as Paul says, as I follow Christ. Follow me as I follow Jesus. You have your own journey, but part of your journey that you're following God is following me and the church on the journey. Does that make sense? Amen. See, and I'm wanting you to come, come on it. That's why I say it's not really a benefit. How does that benefit me? As you become a true follower, a closer follower, as you really are becoming a disciple and sitting under and following Christ closer and and listening to what he has to say and, and pattern your life after his, then before long, a lot of the things in your life are going to dissipate. Today we're going to talk about why things possibly don't dissipate in your life that you want to go away. See, how does that benefit me? Well, now you're healthy. It's not about Sunday morning church, but I'm no longer, follow me, Pastor JP, I'm not, no longer having to go over to the cliff and leave the 99 and find the one. Because you see, the image of that parable is that that sheep was a part of the flock. This isn't about church. Here it is. About, and that shepherd had to leave the 99 to go after the one. In reality, what should have been doing is tending the sheep and then, not that you're out looking for more sheep in the sense of, but tending to the sheep and as those sheep have more sheep, produce sheep, then I, as a shepherd, thank you, Brittany, producing sheep, but also reaching the lost, which is also part of the disciple. She gave me a little grin when I said that. But then I'm actually able to now start shepherding those sheep. See, I, I, I hope this imagery is coming together. So today, I, I want us to look at the authority of the kingdom of God as a disciple. Okay? See, the fact is, as Christians... I'm just going to be very blunt with you. We love, we love to have access and to use the authority of the kingdom of God, don't we? Don't we? I mean, don't we like in the name of Jesus? Come on. We like the authority. Satan, get out of here, right? I rebuke you. We, we love the idea of having an access to the authority. Hey, all things are possible through Christ Jesus. We, we like that idea, but the reality of it is you cannot experience that authority until you submit yourself to the authority. Amen. That's why sometimes when we pray for people, things don't happen. This, this is, I'm talking about bringing to a place that you are now shepherding other sheep. I'm talking about you bringing your life under the subjection of the kingdom of God to where now Jesus, as he orders your step, you're no longer saying, come on, Lord, follow me. He said, no, you come follow me. And as you follow him, now he can say, that person needs prayer. That person has a demon. You see where I'm going with it? It's about walking under the authority of the kingdom of God. You cannot use any authority if you don't sit underneath that authority. So today, we're going to look at Mark chapter 1 and see what it means to live under his authority. And this is an odd scripture. As I was studying and praying about it, God started feeding into to my spirit uh, because it's a, a different one, because Jesus is going to deal with a demon-possessed man, but we're going to look and see what that means to us in his kingdom and, and how we need to fall under his authority, okay? Because as a Christian, I didn't just enter into this relationship to grow in just my faith, but I entered into a life where I turn over all the authority of my life to someone else, and I yield, and I give up the comfort of my life to Jesus. And I choose to follow him as a disciple, Brother Darrell, I've got a slight ring up here, brother. I don't know if they're hearing it or not. If you could just, I mean, I'm too loud. Mark chapter 1, verse 21. Follow as I read. And they went into Capernaum, and immediately on the Sabbath, he entered the synagogue and was teaching. And they were astonished at his teaching, for he taught them as one who had authority and not as a scribe. So just to bring this, this picture into context today, Jesus is walking around. He's in a region called Capernaum. And he basically goes to church. 
Now, in each of these little villages, these Jewish villages, they would have a synagogue. It was at the temple, but they couldn't every day. They didn't go to the temple in Jerusalem. They would have a church, and this is a church service, and they'd gather on Saturday. That was their Sabbath. They'd go in, and they'd read either from the Torah, which is the books of law, or they'd read from one of the books of the, of the prophets, and then someone would get up and speak, and Jesus shows up this day, and he teaches. Now, we don't know what he taught. There, there's no, Mark did not tell us what he read from or what he taught from, but what we do know is that he spoke with authority and the people who heard it, they said, wow, they were astonished at his teaching because he taught with authority. Whatever he was teaching not only astonished the listeners, but the authority within he was teaching prompted a response from someone in the congregation. And immediately, verse 23 says, there was in their synagogue a man with an unclean spirit. And he cried out, what have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I, I know who you are. You're the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, be silent and come out of him. And the unclean spirit convulsing him and crying out with a loud voice came out of him, came out of the man. And they were all amazed so that they questioned among themselves, saying, what is this? A new teaching with authority? He commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey him. And at once his fame spread everywhere throughout all the surrounding region of Galilee. So Jesus is in here, he's teaching, and his teaching with authority, this demon-possessed man, the demon realizes, you are Jesus, you are the Son of God. I recognize this authority and, and, and immediately he comes up and he confronts Jesus. But Jesus, what does he do? He didn't get panicked. He didn't get alarmed within his authority in a very calm way. He rebukes the spirit in the man. From this, this, this scripture comes the reality, a very real reality. I don't want you to be scared. If you're a child of God, you have no reason to be scared. But there is an evil kingdom that is work that is in, at work in our world today. There is a real kingdom of darkness that is at work. And, and as a matter of fact, there exists in our world various types of kingdoms that are at work in our lives today. There are the kingdoms of man, man-made kingdoms that we all find ourselves in at times, okay? There, 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 there's these earthly manly kingdoms. It, it, it's a system, it's a place, it's a place of employment uh, it could be a place of employment whether where you fall under this system. It could be some type of group, club uh, that you're a part of. It could be a social group. And there, there, they, within there, there's a kingdom, there's a system of doing. It, we know from the fact that we live in the United States of America that there is a system of rule. That's, that's what kingdom means. It means there's a reign, there is a rule that we all must fall under. And then, of course, there is Satan's kingdom which influences most of the other kingdoms of this world. Do you understand that? Satan is busy trying to infiltrate other kingdoms that we create in our world to, to infiltrate them, to command them, to bring subjection to them, to bring you to your needs in that kingdom. See, what it means to submit, you, I think I passed over the definition of submitting to authority, but basically submitting to authority means you place yourself underneath that authority. You place yourself underneath the, the influence, the leading, the guidance of that kingdom or that king, whatever or whoever it may be. So we have that in our world, and Satan has it. Paul describes his kingdom as principalities and powers and, and spiritual weaknesses, w wickedness in high places. Lord, help me right now with my words. My brain's going faster than my lips can keep up. My tongue can keep up this morning. This is just, we have to understand this. There is an evil kingdom at work in this world that's controlling man's kingdoms. But then there's also God's kingdoms, our God's kingdom. And the authority and the rule that comes with it. There is a way, there's a system, there's a rule that, that, that in God's kingdom. And this is the kingdom that should matter the most. What this text we just read communicates to us, as well as many other places in the Bible, is that there is no eternal threat to the kingdom of God. I'm going to say that again. There is no external threat. Matter of fact, there is no threat whatsoever to the kingdom of God. You have to grasp that this morning. It communicates to us that Jesus is king of kings. Yeah. 
He is Lord of, he is over everything. You, do you understand who it is that you are following? He is the teacher, no doubt. You need to follow under his teaching. You need to listen to his teaching as a good student. But he's also a king that you are to bend your knee and subject yourself to. And here's the thing, when you do, there's no threat to you from any other kingdom unless you subject yourself to that kingdom rule and authority. Uh, that makes me shout a little bit inside. When I place myself under the authority in the kingdom of the king of kings, all those benefits are mine because I'm subjected to his authority, his rule, his system, his way of living, his way of doing, his way of doing life. As I follow him, he says, I'm going to teach you. This is the kind of king we serve. I'm going to teach you. I'm going to put my arm around you, and I'm going to guide you, and I'm going to show you things. Then not what he did with his disciples? And then when the enemy come against them, or when they were presented with challenges, he said, let me show you how you should do it. And he says, and guess what? One day you're going to do these things and even greater things. Because I'm going to be with you to the end, see? It's his kingdom. It's his kingdom. The good news is that in a world that is hurting and being destroyed by sin, there is a king with a kingdom that has come to rescue us. We just celebrated that in the communion. And someday all earthly kingdoms will fall. Not all, he has authority over all those today, but they're all not bending their knee to him today. Come on, right? We know that. But one day we know every knee, every kingdom, every authority will be crushed and he will rule alone. There will be no competition. There will be no false kingdoms, no false Christ, no false gods. That He will rule forever. And one day Satan's kingdom will be destroyed. The kingdom of God will rule forever and ever. Man, what a day that's going to be. Now the Bible gives us plenty of scripture to show us what God's kingdom looked like. And within his kingdom there's this peace that comes with it. How many of y'all are looking for peace today? Yeah. Well, within it there is a peace that comes with his kingdom. There's a type of morality that is built upon his kingdom principle. See, we can enjoy that. There's a kind of ethics that are lived out in that kind of kingdom. And, and Jesus' Sermon on the Mount by itself, if you look at it, it, it's a preview of what his kingdom will look like. And he challenges us now as his followers to live in that kingdom now. It's not a kingdom that we'll live in one day when we pass from this life to the next. It's not a futuristic kingdom. Yes, there will be a day where he'll set foot back on the Mount of Olives, riding that white horse with faithful and true on his robe, and he will rule from Jerusalem for a thousand years. Yes, that will be the, but he says and he invites us today, we can live within the kingdom. He came to establish his kingdom in our hearts today. And with it, can I be honest with you? We are to take on this world and turn it over to his kingdom rule. It is, yes. That's how you want to change your world? Get your neighbor to accept Jesus as Lord and Savior. If they are a Christian and they're not walking the walk that we're talking about, they're not really being discipled, invite them over for Bible study and see if that doesn't help them along the way. I'm telling you, church, it's here. It's, it's, it's like one plus one equals two. It's not complicated. We just have to submit ourselves to the authority of Jesus and his kingdom. I hope you're grasping this. I know my mind is just going pew, pew. That, that may be that double shot, too. I don't know. The coffee I drank this morning. When you enter into a relationship with the king, you enter to his kingdom and become a citizen of that kingdom. And Jesus is not just your teacher. He's now your king. Now, I get it. We are citizens of the United States. And I'm proud to be a citizen of this nation. But I can I tell you, I'm first a king, citizen of the kingdom of God. And where Jesus modeled that we, we subjected those in authority over us, he never did it to the point that it compromised his kingdom lordship or where it compromised what the, the word would tell him, what his father would tell him. See, And nor should we. I am a citizen of the United States. I'm going to follow their laws and their rules until it compromises what the word of God says. See, I first and foremost am a citizen of the kingdom of God. God, I subject myself to him and all the other kingdoms in this world, in your life, they must fall. All my kingdoms must fall under the authority of Jesus. Now, on this particular day in the synagogue, there was a battle fought. 
It was between the kingdom of darkness and the kingdom of God. And this demon-possessed man, upon enter, in, in, encountering the authority of Jesus, asked an interesting question here. Did you hear this? Why are you here? Are you going to destroy us? The demon was concerned about, was this Jesus now going to establish his kingdom? Us. All the scripture points out that the man only had one demon, but he's talking to us. So he's talking about the spiritual realm. Are you here to destroy us? But did you notice, what did Jesus do? He didn't answer to that demon, did he? You know why? Because Jesus doesn't answer to a lesser authority. Jesus' kingdom is above the dark kingdom of Satan. And he just simply says, you know what? You just need to get on out of here. I, you're not even worth my time to answer. I don't have to have a conversation with you. Because why? You're under my authority. Get out. And what happened? The demon had to leave. He fought, but he had to leave. See, That's the authority. That is the kingdom of God. And this is just a pre preview of what will eventually happen in eternity with the overthrow of all the threats that are to us. One day, Satan's kingdom, after a thousand years, is going to be loosed. He's going to be defeated and he's going to be thrown into the lake of fire. On all his, and we won't have to worry about that anymore. So what we see here is the power of God's kingdom. How does Jesus handle the demon? Just get out of here. And that should tell us something about who we are as Christians. See, we want that. How many want that type of authority? I'm going to honest. How many, I know the kids came back from camp and said they encountered someone at camp that was legitimately demon-possessed and was crying out and everything, and they got to witness somebody, being a demon being cast out of somebody. I thought, wow, and it didn't scare them. I said, that's great. But the reality is to have that type of authority, you have to subject yourself to the kingdom authority. You can't have one foot in and one foot out. You can't live today for Jesus and tomorrow go live your life the way you want to. And then when the enemy comes and attacks you because you place yourself under his kingdom authority, do you get the picture? When, when, you, when you step outside to think the kingdom of God, his authority, and you, and you become a subject of another kingdom, even your own kingdom, you no longer have that authority at your use and you open yourself up, subject yourself up to the attacks of the enemy or for life to go crazy. And that's what many of us do, don't we? We go out here, we live our lives, we go, oh my goodness, I've made a mess of my life. The enemy's come against me, he's attacked me. Oh, what am I gonna do? Oh God, God, God. And we come sliding into the altar like a second base and you just stole it, right? I'm just preaching to today. You can get mad at me if you want to, as long as you love me. You don't have to agree with what I'm preaching. But I promise you, if you saw what I saw, and I'm not casting stones, I'm not making eye contact with anyone in particular, all right? Some of y'all putting your heads down, and I'm purposely trying to look over everybody's head. I don't want to say, oh, he's preaching me. Oh, well, no, I might be preaching to you, but not because of any reason. But this is the truth. And our lives get the mess because why? We have placed ourselves under the, we've stopped following Jesus. Would Jesus go and do that? Would Jesus want me to be doing this? Is this God's idea or is this my idea? Is this a good thing to do or is it a bad thing? And I'm not necessarily talking about sin in general. I'm just talking about life's decisions. Some things are amoral, but you want to be under the will of God. And you want to do things according to his kingdom principles. Well, that was extra. That's nowhere in here. i got to find out where I left off. Oh, hey. When Jesus stood up and read the scriptures... Well, this is the, there's two principles, I think, is where I'm at here that you have to, you have to uh, understand, okay? We have to grasp these two principles. First is this. God's kingdom comes with power and not just words. God's kingdom comes with real power. This is a principle that we see right here that Jesus wanted these in the synagogue to understand, and he wants us to understand today. God's kingdom comes with real power. Power. When you're underneath the leadership of the King of Kings and you're walking in step in unity with him and he, he's given you power, he's given you his authority, you don't have to fear him. He has the real power. He's the one who spoke everything into existence anyways. It's real, real power. When he stood up and read the scripture, the people were already impressed. Why? He didn't speak like the scribes. I hope I'm not like a scribe. What the scribes would do is they would get the word, they'd get the, the Torah, they'd get the, 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 the law or one of the prophets, and they would read from it, and then they would just kind of ramble about it or give their ideas of what somebody else thought about it or what their teachers thought about it or who they learned under or what the Pharisees might have told, told them to say because the scribes fell under the Pharisees. And what happened was, is there, was no, there was no passion, there was no authority. It's almost like going through the motions. 
Jesus comes along, and let's face it, if he read from the Torah or one of the books of the prophets that they, that they may have had at that time, then what, what, what is, he's reading the same thing the scribes have read. But he had authority. Why did he have authority? Because when he, there was an anointing upon Jesus, when he is the author of the word, when he spoke it, when he read it, when he taught, there was compassion, there was conviction, there was love behind it. They could see in his voice and his action, his words, how he wanted them to grasp the truth of his father's word so it would change their lives. This isn't about building my kingdom. It's about you falling under the subjection and the authority of God's kingdom so you can have the life. That you, he came with compassion. He came to save the lost sheep of Israel. And he was compassionate about it. He said, whoa, what is this? We've never heard someone with this kind of intensity and this kind of passion. I don't know. Maybe he was a little Pentecostal and he jumped and ran. I don't know. But there was something different when he presented it. There was authority. See, the good news of the gospel is that this, it has the power to change the course of somebody's life. The, the power of the gospel is it has, it has the power to change someone's life. Within the good news of Jesus, there's power that will bring about change in people's lives. It will bring us to repentance. It will bring healing. It will bring deliverance. It gives us wisdom that, that we can actually use to shape our lives. There's real power that moves, that shapes, and changes things in my life. That's the power of the good news of the gospel of Jesus. And I'm completely convinced that the word of God has the power to change me, to change you, to change our church, to change our community, you hear me? To change our nation, to change our world. There's power in the gospel of Jesus Christ. But we have to place ourselves under the authority of the word. Is that the power? It's the message that comes with actual real power. The kingdom of God is a kingdom that saves. It's a kingdom that heals, that casts out evil, uh, that just changes people's lives. It really, I love this term. I heard one person call this, it is the wrecking ball of all the other kingdoms in this world that harms and oppresses the people in this world. Now look, I, I read a lot of commentaries and I read a lot of other books that are biblically based and those are good. So this is not casting stones, but don't allow reading those books to be the substitute of reading the word of God. Amen. Hear me. It's okay to read what somebody has to say about a scripture or subject. I do it. Be honest with you today. I'm, I'm not a book. I'm like a digital book in the sense that I'm giving you what the Lord laid on my heart about this particular text. But you need to go back and read it again and let the power of God's word change your life. And when you hear it, when you read it, subject yourself to it. Because when you start following Jesus and walking according to the authority of his kingdom and you live by this word, your life is going to change. It will change. It has the power to change us, the word of God. The second principle in our scripture is this. Jesus has full spiritual authority over all things in all kingdoms. I've kind of already said this, but let's put it in context. His kingdom is, is not it's just power in the sense that it changes things or makes things happen. It's also the power in the sense of authority, right? This may not be a great analogy. As I was over there, I started typing. God just kind of laid us on my heart. I've got lots of guns. Guns have power. Guns have power. But the reality is, what really gives gun, a gun power is not the bullets, and I'm really not explaining this well, but it's, it's, when a, it's when a law enforcement officer has a badge. Does that make sense? In other words, I can carry a gun, but I don't have authority over you. I can shoot you, obviously. I can bully you if I wanted to, right, I, if I pulled my gun. But what's something about that person who's got a badge? Why? There's authority. There's authority there that you have to subject yourself to, submit to. The kingdom of God has authority over all other kingdoms on earth. The reason why this is important is because you and I every day are building a kingdom, whether you realize it or not. Your own kingdom. We should be building the kingdom of God, and at times we do as his disciples. But then there are those moments in our lives where we're building our very own little kingdom. And we build it. 
where we establish our own authority over things that compete with the kingdom of God. That's a reality. You have to ask yourself, what are you building that is outside the authority of God? In other words, I know he has authority over everything, but let's face it, we don't necessarily give him authority over everything. He doesn't force himself. So you have to ask, what things in your life are you building outside that God would say, this is not really what I want for you? Or what are you doing or allowing that does not line up with the character of Jesus? So if you're to be a follower, an emulator of Jesus, what are you doing, saying, acting that would not line up with Jesus' character? If we're supposed to look at the word and see as a disciple, as a follower, his, how he lived his life, what are you doing that don't line up with it? What are you doing that does not line up with the will of God for your life? See, those kingdoms need to go, and then moment by moment, day by day, as you yield your life to the authority of Jesus, you have to bring your kingdom, your life, under the authority of Jesus. Otherwise, you don't have his authority. So today, everyone needs to answer the question, are you allowing God's kingdom to rule over you? I can't answer that question for you. I don't know. Have you given your life over to the full authority of God's kingdom? And this is important. Let me, t- let me explain something to you that, that is, is not a false teaching, but it's a teaching that is not complete. We, we, have, we have a thought on Christianity today that if I believe a few things, if I believe Jesus is the Son of God, if I believe he's born of a virgin, if I believe he's lived a sinless life, I believe that he died on the cross, if I believe he rose again and I receive all that, then we, we, we teach that's all we need to do and we're saved. And you're right. You, this, is not a, this is not a relationship of works. Salvation is not of works that man would boast. But we stop there. And the reality is, is we, we adopt this escape mentality that all I want to do is avoid hell. Jesus didn't come just to die on the cross so we could avoid hell. He came so we could have life, and the only way we can have that life is we have to subject ourselves to his kingdom authority. See? See, the moment of salvation is just the introduction to the whole new life, to be lived with the kingdom of God, within the kingdom of God. And the Christian life is not just about being saved, it's about entering a kingdom that changes everything about you, because just about everything about you needs to change. That's what it means to be a disciple. I baptized into a new way of life. I'm now following. I'm I'm, I'm, I'm in deep fellowship with the Lord. I'm taking one more step closer to him. I'm reading his word. I'm emulating his patterns. I'm bringing, if if we truly believe that Jesus is the way, the truth, and life, then we would be bringing people. We really believe these things. We would be bringing people to him. And now I'm subjecting myself to the authority of the kingdom. And I am now literally being transformed into the image of Jesus. And that's, that's scriptural. Don't be conformed to the patterns of this world. Be transformed by what? The renewing of your mind. It's about renewing you. It's about becoming into the image of Jesus. So ask yourself this important question. What would your life look like today if it was completely under the authority of the King of Kings? Well, stop a moment. I want you to think about that. What would your life look like today If you subjected yourself, you truly submitted every kingdom in your world, every thought, every action, every attitude. How how would you do your life be if you subjected yourself to the authority of the kingdom of God? How would your life be different? Those areas of sinful attitudes and behaviors, if they were turned over to Jesus. Those things that you're nursing, the bitterness the anger, the unforgiveness, the pride that you're just hanging on to, because eh, there's no big deal. Or how about those addictive tendencies, those things we run to over and over to escape from this life or the pleasure that it brings us, that really all it does is hurt those around us. What if we placed everything under the authority of Jesus? When my life and my heart and my mind are under his authority, I'm now going to walk in the way. This is the way. I'm going to live by godly values. I'm going to walk in step with Jesus. And I'm going to be like Jesus. And you know what? You can ask my wife. She's she's an expert on this. I've not arrived. And I'm about to say, I'm waiting for an amen. I've not arrived. Because why? It's a process. 
But so often we get this idea because it's a process, it's okay that it's taking a long time. <laughs> Come on. Am I wrong? You know? Ah, oh, just, I'm just human. Yeah, you are. You're a lot more human than you are godly. So let's work on the godly side of things, right? It is a process. But here's the thing. You control how fast it goes. You have to subject your kingdoms that you're involved with to the authority of the kingdom of God. And here's the thing. There's two obstacles to this. And we're going to pray. There's two obstacles to this. The two things that keep you from truly submitting. I'm talking about truly walking with God. What does that look like? Being a disciple. Living your life like Jesus would have. Turning the cheek when you get slapped. Turning your, I'm talking about not returning anger for anger. I'm talking about walking in perpetual forgiveness. Loving your neighbor as yourself. Doing to others as you'd have them do unto you. You hear what I'm, you hear what I'm saying? It, it's not about my kingdom and my feelings. No, it's about being like Jesus. Okay? And the two, the two are this. The first is pride. Pride. The idea of submission is not easy because we love our throne in our kingdom, don't we? We want things how we want it. Matter of fact, the world sells this thing. Remember the old day? Get it your way. The commercial was at Burger King. Hold the lettuce, all that. Yeah, have it your way. We like it our way. We like to place ourselves on the throne of our lives, the kingdom, our kingdom. And we like to rule it. It's my way. It's how I want to do things. And that's not, that's, that's pride. We love to rule and rule certain areas of our lives without the influence of God. I don't want God in this area of my life because I know if he got in this area of life, he would not be pleased with this when he knows about it anyways. We compartmentalize things. I know I'm doing more teaching than preaching this morning, but you, we have to get this. Either God is real, and you know my speech. Either God's real and his word is true or it's not. But if it is, let's today make our decision, are we going to live for him? Are we going to live like him? Are we going to, if his kingdom is where I want and I want his authority, I have to live under his authority. I have to live my life the way he wants me to live it. Not because I'm a preacher and a pastor. No, it's because I am a child of God. And I'm not preaching legalism here. You can work out your salvation daily with fear and trembling. I had a discussion with people, some people the other day, and it's like, listen, you can work it out, but let me tell you, there's some black and white issues in the Word of God. And there's some principles. He says, this is not a choice. This is the way my children live and operate. And if you do, here's the benefits of living this way. You get the peace that passes all understanding. You get the protection. I am your strong tower. You don't have to worry about your needs anymore, where you lay your head, what you're going to wear, and all this kind of stuff. He says, you subject yourself. I'm your king. You bend the knee to me. And guess what? I'm not like the kings of this world, Jesus is saying to us today. I'm not here because if you, if you submit to me, it benefits me in any way. How can us living for Jesus benefit him? Have you ever thought about that today? He doesn't need anything. What does God need that he doesn't have, that he can't create, that he can't speak? No, it's not because he wants something from you. He wants something for you. He wants you to live within his peace. He wants to rule your life, not as a tyrant, but as a godly, loving, heavenly father who knows what you need and wants to take care of you. It's your choice. Get off your pride. Get off your pride. Bend to thee. Submit. Pride. No, I can handle it. I know what to do. I've done that before, and I've made big messes of my life. Hi, my name's Tony, and I'm an idiot. <laughs> Thank you for not amening and just laughing. I think my wife amened it over, but that's all right. Second thing, pride's first. The thing, second thing is fear. We get the idea by surrendering, submitting to Jesus that our life is over. And you know, the older I get, this is less, less of an issue. But I know younger people because they have all these aspirations and all these dreams and these ideas that they want to do. And I get it. I've been there. I mean, you've heard me tell the stories of, of my life early on and all the things I want to do and the, the, the deals I made with God. It was out of fear. But the truth is, the moment you surrender and submit is not when life is over. It's just when life begins. I'm telling you. It's about submitting to God, His will for your life, His plans, living out His word. Life begins when you let go of your agenda 
and the things you love. See? Pride and fear. What Jesus did for the man in Mark 1, this, this, is, this is a big aha moment. We, we miss this because we get caught up in, in the authority and the teaching and, and the casting out of the demon, which is, is the emphasis. But what's the underlying message? How do I bring this back around for week to make my point? And here it is. The day that Jesus encountered this man in Mark chapter 1, he gave the man his life back. He gave his life back. Real freedom comes by submitting to Jesus. He is a different kind of king than the world has ever seen. So think about your life. What are the areas of the things in your life that you're holding on to that you've not submitted to the authority of Jesus? And that's a tough question to ask because you may think everything's peachy keen, and I, I understand that. But we all have to stop for just a minute and say, you know, maybe there is an area. Maybe there is an attitude Maybe there is something in my life. Maybe, maybe, and here's the thing. Most of us probably are dealing with something in our lives. We know what the word tells us we should do. But whether for pride or for fear, we refuse to do it. Or we don't want to live that way because it's contrary to the way I want to live. It's not that the children of God live a perfect life. But it is that we try to live perfectly according to his word. Kind of like I tell my staff here. We, we cannot compare to some churches in the way we present ministry because of whatever reason. We, we, don't, we don't have the, the resources of people, whatever, whatever the condition may be. But that doesn't mean we don't try to do excellence. Our excellence may not meet somebody else's excellence, but we can present. It's the same way. My life may not be perfect, but I can strive to live a perfect life. And I, there's, there's, a, there's a trend of thinking. Craig, I'm on my third close and my final one, brother. There's a trend of thinking in the church world. And, and I've kind of hit on this before. And this is just coming, I feel like the Spirit's leading me to say this. It's as if we, we, we deal with brownie points with God. If I do enough, I'm doing some good things for you, Father. I'm doing some good things. I'm teaching a Sunday school class, or you know, I'm 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 being nice at work, and you know, I've stopped watching this, or you know, we make it about the things we do or don't do. And there's some truth to that, but it's not like you can build up an account like we do with our spouses, you know, that love bank account thing. You know what I'm talking about, to where we can afford to start making withdrawals. Grace, God's grace is unlimited. You don't have to earn His grace; it's free, it's unmerited. That's what grace means. But it's like, if I do enough of this stuff, then I can justify or I can do something that's not God's will for my life or something I know he doesn't want me to do. But I have enough good things over here to outbalance the bad things. And you know what? It's not about keeping account. God is a record keeper. We know that. When you get to heaven, your record, as long as Jesus is Lord of your life, Lord, as long as you're covered in blood, you're going to heaven. No doubt about it. So your salvation is not in the balance by your works. But you will be held accountable for your works. You will have the hand accountable for what you did or didn't do. But what if we, you, make it personal. Make it personal. What if I, right now, all my relationships, subject them to the authority of the kingdom of God. If they're ungodly, I'm going to break soul ties. Doesn't mean I can't be friends with people who are unsaved. I'm not saying that. I'm talking about people that you really have a deep relationship with. With. Now, if you're married, you're stuck with each other. Just get saved, okay? Now, I'm not giving permission for divorce. God's not for divorce. But my point is, is there may be some relationships that are not godly. And you know they're not godly. You, they have more of an influence on you than you do on them, and you're following in their steps of what they do. It may be the way you treat, uh, treat your, your family. It, might be, it may be how, how, how you, you treat the stewardship of the things that God has given you. It's, it's all here is what my point is. It may be things that are competing for your love, your attention, your affection. See, I can't answer the question for you. It may be something that you've turned over to him before. 
And you slip back into it. It may be something you've turned over to him, over to him, over to him, over to him, over to him. And I could go to the nth degree before. And you just keep picking it up because you're struggling. We all struggle with things in our lives. Don't subject to the things you struggle with. In other words, don't give in to them. Submit them to the authority of the kingdom of God. Say no to your flesh. I'm preaching again. I know. Say no. Just say no. In the long run, you'll be thankful for it. It's worth submitting it to Jesus again. Don't allow yourself to be afraid of the goodness of God that you don't come back for cleansing again and recommitting to Him. Amen. Father, I thank you, Father, for the day, the anointing that's been in here, Father. Your presence has been so rich, so true. Lord, the worship was so, it was rich. It was thick, God. It was just a, an anointing, a heaviness of your presence today. And I'm so thankful that you are here. And God, I believe, Lord, your anointing has been on me as I presented the truth, God. Being a follower of Jesus is more than just being baptized, God. It's about in relationship with him and then subjecting, submitting ourselves to your kingdom rule, which is your word, Father, and the leading of your Holy Spirit, God. And Lord, we all build kingdoms, God. I know I'm guilty of building kingdoms, Lord. And, and in a way, Father, there's no way not to build a personal kingdom in the sense, Lord, of lives, our lives and how we live it within our family units. But Lord, the key to it is subjecting our kingdoms to your rule, living our kingdoms underneath your authority, God. Really, that is living in your kingdom. So Lord, I pray for everyone that's here today, God, because I believe, Father, that submission is the way. Jesus is the way and is submitting to him and your plan and your purpose for each and every one of us, God. And I pray for this congregation right now. Just evaluate yourself. What if you submitted every area of your life to Jesus and his authority? Just allow the Holy Spirit right now just to move in you and start asking. Ask the Holy Spirit. I guarantee if you ask, he'll answer. You probably already know the answer. But what area of your life, what attitude of your life are you hanging on to that you have not subjected? What, what hurt, what offense is still, is still driving your life and you know that this is not what God would have you. What relationship have you entered into that is not a godly relationship? And, and to be honest with you, it might be a godly one that, that God says, this is not for you. Subject it. I could go continue going down the list, but just open your heart right now to the Holy Spirit to speak into your life. And as he reveals these things, don't ponder them. Don't think upon them. Right now, submit them to God and then do what you know he would have you do in these areas. Change that attitude. Forgive that person. Quit doing those things. Break that relationship. Just whatever he leads you to do, will you submit it this morning? We've got to change our world, church. We've got to, it's got to begin in your life. I love the fact that our young people come back from camp and they're so on fire for God. And can I just tell you, my concern is, is that the world is going to quench that fire. Because if you're honest with yourself, there's a time that you were on fire for God. There was times that you would take on the gates of hell with a squirt gun because you, you were so in love and on fire for the Lord Jesus. And I don't want that for these young people. I don't want that for you. I want you for revival to break loose in your life. You walk the walk and you talk the talk and you live the life and you start changing the world around you. And it begins in your home. It begins with everything in your home. It begins with what you let in your home. It begins with what you say in your home. It begins with the stewardship of your time. We're the busiest people ever, I think, in the history of mankind. I feel like God's just telling us to slow down. Quit dragging him around and follow where he leads you. Follow him. Follow him. He came to lead you into a life that is unbelievable with all the benefits all the benefits. But you have to subject yourself to his authority.